Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felding, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felding. Okay, good to see everybody back again, and uh, well, I think most of our audience realizes that we take 30 minutes and we take a coffee break, and uh, we do this throughout the afternoon, so I don't have to explain that every time. But again, we always want to thank our television audience for your prayers, your, your letters, my, our letters, Iris and I. The more our mail grows, the more I have to hope that you keep them short and yet keep them interesting because we don't want you to just cut it out because you have to keep it short. But uh, my, since we've been back from Greece, we've been reading letter after letter after letter. And uh, they're encouraging. That's all there's to it. They are so encouraging to know that uh, we're not just beating the air but that uh, we are uh, being used of the Lord to touch a lot of hearts and lives. So wherever you are, our audience is now reaching, I think, almost every state in the Union, and we are just flabbergasted as how the Lord is working. Okay, let's just uh, go right back to where we left off, and I was still in the verse we've been in for many, many weeks, but we're on the last half of it. And that's Matthew 6. You don't even have to lock it up. We're going to go right back to where we quit the last program in Philippians. But remember, the theme of our, of our thinking right now is that once we have sought the kingdom of God and His righteousness first, then things shall be added. In other words, the material things, the physical needs, and so forth. All right, we ran out of time in our last program, but since these are all connected and what you don't get today, you'll get tomorrow. So we'll just go right back where we left off in Philippians, if you will. Only now let's go on over to chapter 4. <coughs> still in Philippians, verse 6. Now here, whenever people call with a real prayer need, Iris and I, and I think the girls in the office have learned to do the same thing. These are the first verses that we share with people because it covers everything. Whether you're fighting disease, whether you're fighting marital problems, whether you're fighting a job problem or financial, my, it's all in these two verses. Verse four, or chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful, or worry is probably a better word. Worry about nothing, but in everything. Now you know there are those that say God isn't interested in your material things. God isn't interested in the physical. That's not what this verse says. This says God is interested in every part of your life. And you take it to Him. For in everything, by prayer and supplication, but here's the key, with what? Thanksgiving. So what do you do? You thank the Lord before you even ask. What do you thank Him for? What He's going to do. Now, that's common sense, isn't it? Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do with this prayer request. And then you lay it out for Him. Verbalize it. Lord, I need a job. I need a good job. Lord, I need health. I need marital assistance. Whatever the case may be, take it to the Lord. See? All right, then look. Let your requests be made known unto God. Verbalize them. And then here's the answer to every prayer before the real question is answered. And the peace of God, to know that He's in control, the peace of God, which passeth all understand. It's beyond us. The peace that God can roll over us when we've turned these things over to Him. And so the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, now watch the promise, will keep your hearts and minds, how? Through Christ Jesus and His finished work. That's the promise. Now this is in the realm of the everyday. This isn't talking about the spiritual element, we're talking about everyday needs. All right, now then let's just jump on over in chapter 4 to verse 19. And the apostle knew what it was to suffer physically. I'm sure there were days on end where he had insufficient food. There were days on end when he was in prison and was cold and hungry. But on the other hand, there were days when he was blessed abundantly. <coughs> And so he says, well, let's just read verse 18 as well. But I have all and abound. I am full, 
having received of Epaphroditus the things. Now, what were those? Material things, whatever they were. Whether it was clothing, or whether it was some food, or whether it was from parchments, some, some reading material, doesn't matter. But he's not in the realm of the spiritual here, he's in the realm of the physical. All right? And so the things which were sent from you up there at Philippi, my, we were just there the other day, and uh, we'd never been to northern Greece before, and our group had a, had a beautiful get-together down at the riverside where Paul had dealt with Lydia. And uh, still the same river, I'm sure. You know, Bill's nodding his head. It, it was a beautiful setting. And we just had a good time and shared things from the Word. But uh, and it's an experience that I, I never dreamed would ever come my way. But uh, everything that Paul writes now, we, we, we can equate to a particular place in his ministry. Well, in this case, he's writing to the Philippians up there in northern Greece. All right, so Epaphroditus has brought the things from wherever he was, I think from Thessalonica, Thessalonica and uh, he brings these things which were sent from you, verse 18, reading on, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Well, what's he talking about? What the people of Philippi had sacrificed to send to him, whatever it was. They, they weren't wealthy. Most of the people in northern Greece, which is mountainous, had almost nothing uh, financially. But what little they had, they shared with the apostle. All right, now then verse 19. So the admonition to us is, if God would supply his need, then he'll supply whose? Ours. Ours. But, he says, my God shall supply all your need. Does he say he's going to make you a millionaire? No, that's not what he says. But he's going to supply all our needs. And that's all we have to look for in this life. A roof over our heads, clothes on our back, and food to eat. Those are our needs. And we in America have been blessed so abundantly that we don't know what that is anymore. But you see, in most areas of the world, that's still all they work for from day to day, is just to have a place to live, food to eat, and clothes to wear. We're spoiled. I tell the Lord that almost every day. Lord, I'm spoiled. But on the other hand, I have to tell him, I like it. I'd hate to be otherwise. It may happen. But listen, we better wake up and realize the day may come when all this will be taken from us. It could, you know. But nevertheless, if it should, God will supply our every need. Well, anyway, I think maybe uh, that's enough for the, uh, the Pauline aspect of all these things. Now let's move on to another one of the the buts that we're working on, but God, or but uh, Noah, as it was back in Genesis. And uh, now I'm going to take you over to Matthew chapter 10. And the reason I'm going to use it, even though I've used it over and over and over in my classes and in my seminars, we use it again on our trip in the Aegean Sea, because as I told in the last taping, my title of all my messages was going to be, Why Paul? And I made the point. I remember specifically making the point. Why did the Lord need this 13th apostle when he had 12? But there was an intrinsic reason for it. The 12 were apostles of Israel. And they had no ministry to the Gentile world, and they knew they didn't. So in order for God to reach the Gentiles, he had to raise up another apostle which was Paul or Saul of Tarsus. All right, now here is why I use this so often. You all know by now that Paul wrote to 2 Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed. What's the rest of the verse? Rightly dividing the word of truth. And that means exactly what it says. The word rightly divide in the Greek, and now I'm not a Greek scholar, I just look up a few of these things that I think are pertinent. And this word in the Greek actually means to cut straight. You don't just do it like you break bread. You cut it straight, like, like cutting a pie. You don't just delve into a pie and, and handle out chunk by chunk. What do you do? You cut it into slices. You rightly divide it. In fact, I think I used that in an illustration years ago. 
If you've got a, a pie and you've got five people, how are you going to cut it? In four pieces? No. If you're going to use the whole thing at once, you'll cut it into how many? Five. You may cut according to the size of the people that are going to be eating it. Maybe you got a little four-year-old, doesn't need a big full, but whatever. To cut straight is rightly dividing that pie. I make my point? That's what we do with the Word of God. We don't just ram sackle through it and say, well, I can divide this here. I can no. You cut it according to the divine purposes. And that's why I'm going to use these verses again with one of the but gods. All right, come down to Matthew 10, verse 5. And I'm sure we're going to have some people out there that have never heard me use this before. Bound to. And for the rest of you, it's just like eating meat and potatoes day after day after day. All right, here we are. These twelve, the twelve disciples, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Now, did you hear that? That was specific. Go not into the way of the Gentiles into any city of the Samaritans, who were half-breeds and were almost outcasts of Israel, and so any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. Don't have a thing to do with these two classes of people. Now here's the but, the flip side. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you know, most highly educated theologians can't read that. They can read it, but they don't understand it. But that's a specific dividing of the Scriptures. Here we have a message that is not for the Gentile world, it's for Jew only. And until you get that through your head, you'll never understand this book. That all the way from the call of Abraham on up until we get to the Apostle Paul, it's everything God dealing with Israel with some exceptions, yes, by His divine purposes. But on the whole, here's where we have to divide Scripture. That all the way up through the Old Testament, it's Jew only, Jew only. Now, I always like to use a verse that explicitly says that, so keep your hand in Matthew and go back with me to Acts chapter 19. Because I like people to see that I'm not pulling these little words or phrases out of the woodwork, as we say, but they come right from the book. Acts, did I say 19? I want 11. Acts 11, verse 19. Sorry about that. Now, you see, if I had a pre-written script, that wouldn't happen. But I don't believe in pre-written scripts. Acts 11, 19. Just to show you the phrase. Now, this is 8, 9, 10 years after Pentecost maybe even 11, long after Pentecost. And the Jewish believers are still under intense persecution from various sources, mostly from the Orthodox Jews who rejected Jesus of Nazareth, and these Jews had embraced him. All right, Acts 11:19. Now they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose or began at the time of Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, Preaching the word, now there's no Pauline epistles yet, there's no four gospels yet, so the only word they've got is what? Old Testament. But these Jews are now covering that into the Mediterranean Sea, preaching the word to none but what? Jews only. That's what your book says as well as mine. And people just can't get it. And they keep coming back and tell us that Jesus ministered to the Gentiles and Peter ministered to the Gentiles. No, they didn't. The book says they ministered to none but Jew only. And you either believe it or you don't. But I do. Consequently, I teach the way I do. Now come back to Matthew. This is where it all really came to a head. Where now Jesus explicitly tells his 12 apostles, you don't have a thing to do with the Gentiles. You don't have a thing to do with the half-breed Samaritans. Why? 
because he came to fulfill the covenant promises. That's why I covered the covenants here several times back. The Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, which simply means the promise that the land of Palestine, what we now call Israel, was promised by God himself. I don't care what the world says. It belongs to the nation of Israel. All right, and then we had the, uh, did I mention the Davidic and the new? Now those were all covenant promises that were directed to the nation of Israel in view of their coming king and this glorious earthly kingdom that we alluded to in the last program. Now the Gentiles had no part in those covenants. They were between God and Israel. So we see when the Lord Jesus came and began his ministry, he had to put it this way, or he would have been completely in disagreement with his own covenant promises that he had made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, and all the rest. All right, now you cannot take these covenant things and funnel them into the church without getting in trouble. So what do we do? We leave them where they are. We rightly divide. That piece of the pie belongs to Israel. Ours is coming later. And so we rightly divide the scripture. Not old and new. I heard one preacher on the radio made that comment, and I just about go through the pickup roof, you know, that the only way to divide scripture is separate the old from the new. How can you separate the Old Testament from the four Gospels when it's all God dealing with Israel? That reminds me of another young man who was making application to one of our large seminaries, and he made... <laughs> He all thought of it afterwards. It was probably a foolish statement, but he told this one interrogator to see if he was fit to come in the seminary that he saw no difference between the four Gospels and the Old Testament. He said, I thought they'd throw me out within five minutes. But it's right. You can't separate these four Gospels from the Old Testament. It's all under the law. It's all dealing with Israel. Nothing concerning the Gentile world. And here's why I'm teaching this today that here Jesus himself is saying, go not in the way of the Gentiles, go not in any manner, but, flip side, where were they to go? To the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and no one but. Now that's a great divide, see? And here's where we have to draw the line in Scripture. How can you go against that kind of a commandment from the words of the Lord himself and just simply say, no, they went to the whole Gentile world? No, they did not. All right, let's just go a little further. Let's go to Acts. Now we're at seven, eight years after Pentecost again. Stephen has just been stoned. Now we move into Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, now get the time frame. You know, that's what we appreciated about our Aegean cruise. We were able to put the history and the geography all in view of the spiritual element. Everything just all of a sudden fell in place. All right, so here we are, seven, eight years after Pentecost, Saul has just wrought havoc amongst those Jews who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah. Now remember, that's the whole dividing line in Israel. Those small percentage of Jews had embraced Jesus as the Messiah, but the rest of them ridiculed him and scorned him as, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know the account. All right, now here we are. Acts 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church. Now, I always have to stop when I come to that word. It's the Greek word ecclesia, which translated or defined by a called out assembly. That's all. That's what the ecclesia was. A called out assembly that had separated from the rest of all that was around them. When Israel came out of Egypt, and they're gathered around Mount Sinai, Acts chapter 7 calls them a church in the wilderness. Now, goodness sakes, they weren't a church with pastors and bishops and deacons. They were a called-out assembly of Jews. 
Now, when we were in Ephesus, we saw the humongous theater that all the silversmiths fled into or flowed into in all the opposition against the Apostle Paul because he was ruining their trade amongst the silversmiths. But the book of Acts calls that riotous mob a what? An ecclesia. It was a called out assembly, not spiritual. A bunch of hoods actually caused the riot, but the scripture calls it an ecclesia, a called out assembly. All right, now in the same way with this Jewish element in Jerusalem. They had separated from the mainstream of Israel because they had embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And so now they're meeting together. They go from house to house and they break bread. So what are they? A called out assembly. But unfortunately, our translators call them what? A church without any distinction. So everybody thinks that the church in Jerusalem is already a Pauline Grace Church. No, it is not. It's a church comprised of law-keeping Jews who are still using temple worship. They are still adhering to the Old Testament laws of food and everything else, but they're called a church. Okay, now let's go on. So great persecution against this called-out assembly of Jewish believers in Jesus. And it was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered abroad. We just read about them in chapter 11, 19. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except who? Except who? The apostles. Now, according to most of Christendom by now, eight years after Pentecost, where were the apostles? Preaching to the Gentile world. What a travesty. Not according to this book. There is not one record in here of any of the twelve ministering to the Gentile world. Not one. Now, maybe church history alludes to it, but I don't go by church history. I go by the book. And these men were just in the same category as what Jesus told the twelve back there in Matthew, go not into the way of a Gentile. Because those Jewish men had only one allegiance, and that was to the covenant promises. This is what you've got to get straight. This is what we call rightly dividing the Word of God. But you see, at this very same time, or within the next few months at least, while the apostles are sticking tight to Jerusalem, here is this persecutor on his way to Damascus, and outside the city gate, I trust you all know, most of America doesn't anymore, the younger generation, they don't know what the Damascus Road experience is, but you do. What happened? God saved the persecutor. And what did he tell him? At least through Ananias. What did he tell him? I'm going to send you far hence to the Gentiles. There's the big divide. There's the big divide. Everything has been Jewish, and now all of a sudden the emphasis is going to switch to the Gentile world through the 13th apostle. And we're going to see, I guess I might as well do it now. Go back with me to Galatians. Go back to Galatians. Romans, Corinthians, Galatians. Chapter 1, honey. Let's start at verse 11. I've used these verses over and over through the years because they are so descriptive. They are so explanatory of what we call dividing the Scriptures. And here Paul is showing us so emphatically that he had nothing to do with the twelve apostles of Israel. He couldn't, because they were all associated with the law and Israel and temple worship and all the rest. But you and I have nothing to do with those things. They're past. They've been crucified. Okay? Galatians 1, starting at verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. But I certify you, brethren. Now remember, he's writing to Gentile believers that he has brought together in one of his earlier missionary journeys up there in central Turkey, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now there is that total separation then of Paul from 
the twelve and their ministry to Israel. All right, now he goes on in these succeeding verses, starting there at verse 13, and he's merely proving the point that he is a separate, designated apostle of the Gentiles, totally separated from Israel. Now, I don't want to lose the verse we jumped off from in Matthew, where Jesus said, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, whereas now this apostle is just as definitely instructed to go to the Gentile world as the twelve were to go to Israel. All right, now in verse 13, and our time is about gone. For you have heard of my conversation or manner of life in times past in the Jews' religion. He was a Jew's Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisee. And how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, in other words, that same church in Jerusalem, the ecclesia of Jesus' believing Jews, I persecuted that ecclesia of God and wasted it. He destroyed it. Then verse 14, I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He was a, he was a religious fanatic. But, verse 15, I could have used this as another good one. I may again. <laughs> but, when it pleased God, not Paul, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace. And that's where you and I are. We're here by virtue of His grace, not by virtue of our genealogy, not by virtue of our denominational background. We're here by grace. All right? Then verse 16, but in Paul's life, what was the real purpose of separating him? To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him, God the Son, among the Gentiles, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. All right, I'm going to come back quickly to Romans 16, verse 25, and then we'll pick it up again in our next program. But come back with me, honey, to Romans 16, verse 25, in the few seconds we have left. And this is what he's referring to. Verse 25, Now to him who is of power to establish you according to my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery or these things which were kept secret since the ages began. That's what you call rightly dividing the scripture and only Paul received these mysteries. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.